such amazing readings this morning, it was difficult to choose what to say and to do justice to both of those readings, the one from Acts and the one uh, we've just heard from the Gospel. But I thought today maybe we would have a look a bit more at St Paul. I thought we'd have a look at the man himself, where he came from, find out a bit more about him and maybe how we can relate today. One of the great days in Christian history and the history of the church is the conversion of, of Saul of Tarsus. The importance of this indication, uh, this conversation is indicated, sorry, conversion is indicated by the fact that it's mentioned three times in the book of Acts, in chapter 9, as we heard this morning, in chapters 22 and 26. And Paul often alludes to it in his epistles. The conversion of this particular man became the pivot on which his life and the history of the church turned. In huge measure, we are indebted to this man for what we know about God and about salvation because of his letters and how they provide so much information and instruction. Where would we be without Paul's letters? However, Paul himself would probably say that it was not a conversion at all. He did not change from one faith to another, but rather saw Christ as the culmination of his Judaism, the Messiah that every Jew was waiting for. Therefore, not a conversion, but a fulfillment. Saul was quite a unique person, by birth, a Jew, by citizenship, a Roman, by education, a Greek, and by grace, a Christian. He was a missionary, a theologian, evangelist, pastor, organizer, Leader, thinker, statesman, fighter of truth, trailblazer, especially for women's ministry. And at the same time, lover of souls. He spoke Hebrew, Greek and Aramaic. And he is great evidence of the fact that God can take the worst of the worst and make them the best of the best. Nobody is ever too unredeemable. I think maybe there are times when we wonder whether the grace of God can be ever extended in certain cases. And that often becomes the exact time when the grace of God does its greatest and most glorious work. Saul's home was a town called Tarsus. Tarsus is located, or was located, at the corner where Asia Minor met Syria just to the north of Israel. It is a, was a city distinguished for its cosmopolitan interests. Many people gathered there. The wharves of the river Sidnus were crowded with commerce. It was almost fa also famous for its university. Along with the universities of Athens and Alexandra, the one in Tarsus ranked in the top three. Those great universities were the Oxbridge of their day. Saul's father was a Roman citizen, and Saul inherited that right from him, which helped him greatly in later years. His father was also a Jew and a Pharisee, so Paul can zealously match his credentials with any Jew. In keeping with Jewish tradition, every boy had to learn a trade. One of the large industries in that city of Tarsus was tent making. So the young Saul learned his trade. He was able to weave cloth from the black hair of goats into strips and tie them together to make tents, a skill still used today. We, as a family, have several times been rescued or healed by Bedouin in the desert and have been very thankful for the cooling shade these goat hair tents give. Those are probably stories for another day. At the age of approximately 13, Saul was packed off to Jerusalem in Jerusalem, he sat under the great teacher by the name of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was called the beauty of the law because of his marvellous ability to teach. He was so revered that when he died, people said that the reverence for the law had died with him. Saul studied under this brilliant man, and the course of his study would be memorization of great portions of the Old Testament. He became scholarly in terms of his knowledge of the Old Testament. And he would sit and question and 
answer, se with answer sessions with his tutor. So he was very familiar with Jewish history and theology. Since it's never mentioned in the Bible that, Paul, uh, that Saul or Paul, Paul is the Greek version of Saul, uh, although it's never mentioned that he met Jesus, although they were te contemporaries, it's likely that after having studied in Jerusalem, Paul went back to Tarsus and perhaps there became a master teacher in a synagogue. But later on, he does return to Jerusalem, as we know, and we hear the story of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. Jesus has already disappeared from the scene at this point when Saul confronts Stephen. Now, Stephen was a dynamic, bold, dramatic and powerful, and Saul found it difficult to compete with him. He'd met his match. The only thing that he could do was to get rid of him. And so Stephen was killed, the first Christian martyr. From the time of Stephen's death, Saul became a leader of, of the persecution movement. Years later, in Acts 26, he acknowledges this himself. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only shut up many of the saints in prison by authority from the chief, chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in a raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Jerusalem wasn't enough. He chased them all over the lands. According to Acts 3, he made havoc with the church. Meanwhile, Philip and the Hellenistic Christians who have been scattered by the ravaging Paul have gone elsewhere preaching in the Christ's name. Saul's persecution led to widespread preaching, which led to salvation of many. And only a couple of weeks ago, we heard the story of Thomas, who established the faith and the church in India. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, Saul is still furiously persecuting Christians to incarcerate and kill. Eventually, he accomplishes something of what he set out to do in, the, in Jerusalem, and now he's intent on seeking out little pockets of Christians elsewhere. He is really zealous. It's not a game. In his mind, Christianity is a heresy, the defamation of the character of God and the traditions of Judaism. Apparently, he then hears about a group of Christians in Damascus, so he decides to go there and take care of that group. And we've just heard that story. If you should go to Damascus today, well, possibly not today, but hopefully sometime soon, you can still walk up Straight Street with its bustling shops, and you can go to the house of Ananias, the man Jesus asked to go and cure Paul of his temporary blindness and where Paul stayed for some time to be taught about Jesus and the Christian faith. You can still see the wall where the disciples in Damascus lowered Paul over so that he may escape persecution himself. 2,000 years is only recent history in the Middle East. It is all still there. A city still full of Christians, yes, even today, who trace their ancestry back to pre-Paul they are some of the very first Christians. So what can we draw from Paul's conversion today in our world? Well, firstly, Paul was a fanatic, what we might call a fundamentalist, something that we are very familiar with today. We see untold amounts of murder committed in the name of Allah, just the Arabic word for God. Reports only this week tell us that Christianity is now the most persecuted religion in the world. And the murder goes on even if we don't hear the full extent of it. 2,000 plus Christians murdered in Nigeria. Many more in Iraq, in Syria, have lost their lives. There is a real fear that Christianity will disappear completely from the Middle East, the Holy Lands, where it began. And this is why we celebrate the conversion of St. Paul. 
because his conversion gives us hope for other conversions. For if a man as certain as St. Paul can be knocked off his high horse, can be forced to con confront his misrecognitions, can be called to conversion, then the same must be true of others. And for this, we must pray. We must pray at every opportunity, without ceasing for these fundamentalists, for these terrorist organisations, that God can make the same change in their hearts as he made in Paul's. Don't think it can't happen because we can see it's happened. We've read about it today. And don't think that persecution won't come here. Don't let the fact that it's currently happening in far away places stop you from praying hard. Don't think that we in the West are safe here. Though we may not suffer so much from terrorism, from persecution here in the same ways, we are certainly suffering the er eradication by secularism. Pray. Prayer is the biggest weapon we have. A weapon of peace, but a mighty one. <coughs> Excuse me. And secondly, we see someone complicit in murder who becomes the founding father of Christianity. How many churches are named after St. Paul? How many Bible studies have you looked at studying the words of St. Paul and those early Christian communities, communities that he established? If God can take someone like Paul and use him, he can take anyone. How many times has guilt or lack of confidence stopped you from doing something you felt you might have been called to? You see, God knows you completely. He knows the thoughts of your mind. He knows your every action, your every good need, deed, and your bad ones. And yet he still loves you. He loves you with a love stronger than any human parent. And he still wants you, each of you, to work with him. Despite everything, all that he knows about you, and he still wants you on his side. Today we read the story of St Paul, the fundamentalist who ordered the murder of many, and the reason we celebrate him is not just for what he became, but for what he was, a fallen human being, just a little bit worse than us, and the sure knowledge that God can use anyone, if only we would let him. So what conversion will God create in your heart today? Amen.